everyone. We are kicking off episode number one with Dr. Mike Caps of Diveplane. Mike spent most of his career building Epic Games from 20 employees to a global gaming powerhouse, leading the creation of the Unreal Engine, the Gears of War franchise, and personal favorite, Fortnite. He retired as president of Epic Games in 2012 to focus on his family. But in 2017, Mike came out of retirement to see if he could make a dent in one of the largest problems that we face today, the ethical problems of black box AI making decisions that affect people's lives and welfare. The founders of Diveplane agree that the company's top goal was the replacement of black box AI with transparent and ethical methods, even above profits. And Diveplane's investors share the goal of social impact alongside this entrepreneurial return. So welcome, Mike. We are thrilled to have you. I do really want us to get rich, by the way. That would be fantastic. It's just not <laughs> first. Not <laughs> first. That's all. As um, I was but... doing that intro, I was like, wow, this is really, this is truly impressive. But I'm I am curious. So you you want to get rich, but you were retired. So what what drove you out of retirement? Yeah, I I we did pretty well with Fortnite, so uh, no complaints there. I retired at 40, which sounds like an awfully awesome dream, but with little kids at home, you know, it, and then they went to school and I was like, what the hell do I do with myself? And so I literally made a list of things that I thought were important enough to go to work every day for and, you know, show the kids that like, hey, it's important to get out there and try to contribute and made a short list and AI was one of those three. And it was the one that I found the most opportunity to be helpful in. So still at it. Can, can you share what the other two are? Sure. You know, so one of them was Metaverse and this was around 2016. And I was really concerned that we would find ourselves working and playing in Facebook. You know, mm -hmm. you put on your Facebook glasses and go work all day in Facebook for what was it, Libra dollars. And then in the evening, start playing with your friends who are already in Facebook, and then you're playing in the Facebook meta space. And so I brought together a whole bunch of great companies, Google and Amazon and Epic and Unity and others to talk about open standards for metaverse to make sure it was more like the web and less like AOL. And so that was the idea. And we were a little early, but also it didn't really play out that way, which is great. And the other was child trafficking on a short list of things that really pissed me off. And I was like, this is a data problem as much as it is an enforcement problem and tried to dig into it. But having a video game background turns out to be really useful in AI and not so useful in child trafficking in black market. So there you go. That's why I'm here. Fascinating. So is, is the metaverse, as most people envision it, this sort of VR world or are we sort of living in the metaverse already because our digital identities are extraordinarily valuable to us and what you do online now matters as it didn't before i think really facebook's real name policy no, no it's, it's a great question you know i always envision the black sun neil stephenson approach to you know we're in there all day we're ready player one or the like but mm -hmm. yeah, are we backing into it a little bit at a time? Yeah, absolutely. Like my Apple ID is a really important piece of my identity. And my kids' Apple IDs are important to them. And how we manage that, how we protect it. And then there'll be some 3D component to it someday. Maybe it's going to be an augmented reality display that you're wearing. Who knows? But my World of Warcraft character, I tell you what, you want to talk about a lot of investments and a virtual character that people know me only virtually and all that. I don't play so much anymore, but it was a huge investment in a metaverse. The only thing separating World of Warcraft from the metaverse is you couldn't take your character to Fortnite. But as soon as we saw that, it's your same character in Fortnite and World of Warcraft. And yes, these are different games by different producers, but they collaborate. That's what the web is. And mm -hmm. if you do that in 3D, then poof, we have a metaverse. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. And, and so your concern sort of on that part of metaverse was that sort of one company or just limited number of companies would sort of control it. And you wanted to, again, if you were going to do the metaverse part, that right. you wanted to sort of create a federated approach to it, or, or was it about sort of regulation or about setting some standards for 
interoperability and or ethics or like well, what, so, what, so what pieces that, were like interesting? Yeah, these these were all the, the key problems, right? So if you think of how the web evolved, you know, I, I, I think I started the first website for a university in the United States because I was a web nerd back in the 90s and all the protocols were open, all mm -hmm. shared freely and, you know, kind of grew up everywhere. And then there was that moment of AOL consolidating and creating a walled garden and an experience where my parents were comfortable and eventually that it, it couldn't provide enough of an experience. But what was happening in VR was sort of the exact opposite, where it wasn't there are thousands of little websites and some early companies trying to use the web and it's an open standard. It was closed standards everywhere, people trying to develop their own tech. Facebook requiring a Facebook login to use the meta headset, right? Like, oh my gosh, this is exactly the wrong direction for openness and share. So that was the concerns that we never had companies like Meta, Google, Twitter, that had eyeballs for hours a day and owned your entire social network. Like, you know, if if, if Meta goes away, I don't have my Facebook friends anymore. I lost 10 <laughs> years of investment, right? Or 15 now, who knows? And that's where I talk to certain friend groups. It's the only place I'm in touch with them, right? They own that network, not me. And there was nothing like that as the web was coming along. And so it just seemed more possible you could end up with a dystopian one winner equation mm -hmm. in the metaverse mm -hmm. because the dollars are so big. There was no money in the web in the beginning, right? But is there money in those social networks? Oh my gosh, it's the biggest companies in the world are advertising. Mm -hmm. companies, right? Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. But it's sort of on the other hand, like whenever you have sort of an integrated solution versus a bunch of sort of parts trying to work together, Apple ecosystem, for example, versus sort of OEMs of, of Android, right? Yeah. The, the user experience. They're evil, right? Apple is <laughs> totally evil. Totally. Tell you what? <laughs> exactly. The whole house. thing is Apple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, but that, we, we choose those evil things because they're more convenient and they're more integrated. And mm -hmm. because I think we humans optimize for convenience, convenience. and utility and mm -hmm. While we talk about privacy and we talk about security, you know, as we know, most people don't 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 really care about that. I mean, oh, yeah. don't it's, take steps to deal with it. What we learned in video games very quickly was charge a dollar for something and nobody's interested. Make it free if they just give you all of their personal information and let you track them all over the internet. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely can have some more coins. If I connect my Facebook account, I can have some more coins, right? People will sell their digital identity so quickly to avoid mm -hmm. paying a dollar. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense when you think about it, because then, you know, those companies are reselling that same information for 10, but that's yeah. what it is. But yeah, but that, that maybe, maybe we can stick here for a bit. Yeah. I actually wasn't expecting to talk to you about this, but I think this is a, a good area of conversation. It might be interesting to people. We, we take it as sort of fact, that your personal information sort of being available to marketers or sort of sitting in these silos of Google and Facebook and other places that sort of have large troves of, of your behavioral information, mm -hmm. sort of implicitly collected data by you using their services and some explicitly provided data that you gave them to fill out a profile or whatever else. That we we say, well, that that's terrible and that's scary, and and we shouldn't do that, and, and and there's a problem with that. But I guess playing sort of devil's advocate a bit, but like there are certainly some vulnerabilities in having all of that information sort of stored in these places and available, and we've seen examples of that being misused. You know, Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. is sort of a famous one of that, although it was less about sort of that information, more about their ability to use it. And, and, and sort of weaponize it, right? weaponize it exactly. Yeah. Again, I think mo most consumers, while they take it as fact that that's bad, don't quite understand what's so bad about it. And therefore they are not taking any meaningful steps to behave differently. And I guess my question is, I, I wonder if we're overblowing and, and sort of extrapolating too much on what's bad about these things. And maybe they are not so bad after all, that sort of having your data be used by services to make their services better 
is a is a is a good trade off for consumers to make, rather than sure. fear what could happen by some hypothetical thing. Yeah, I love this topic. Let's let's jump in. All right. So on the one side, of course, you've got the concern of misuse by government. Right. My wife is a facial plastic surgeon. She's one of the best in the world. She had someone fly in from China, and that person had to register their surgery with the Chinese authorities because facial recognition systems were going to not work for her. And mm -hmm. so before she had a legal problem, she had to warn them in advance, I'm going to look different. Here's the process I'm going through. Here will be my new process. Mm -hmm. um, and just saying that to someone in America is just mind blowing, but it's not that far away, right? You know, that's, that's actually happening right now with a well-run technological system. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so we're one of the founders of the Data and Trust Alliance. Data and Trust Alliance is, uh, I think, maybe 24 institutions now, and it's CEO-led. It's the CEO of Walmart and IBM and MasterCard and American Express and Starbucks and Roger Goodell from the NFL, the director, right? So, and the whole reason we came together was to try to tackle this problem of consumer data trust responsibility, because you're right. There's huge value in Starbucks knowing where I live, where the nearest shop is, what kind of coffee I like, both for them in aggregate to make better decisions about where to put shops and what kind of coffee, but also for me. Like mm -hmm. I got a coffee after I had a, a doctor's appointment this morning and it's like, oh, Mike, I know what you want based on the time of day. I know what you want and I know where the store is and just click here and I've already got your money and God, that's wonderful. And I don't really care if someone finds out my secret addiction to lattes, right? You know, the downside for me, very low. They might steal my credit card, but we've become so inured to credit card theft that like, whatever, it's not even my problem. It just, oh, it's a pain. I have to get a new physical card. And now I don't even have to do that because I'm using Apple. Pay. Where it gets tricky is the amount of digital effluent that you've got in, say, healthcare, where... You know, I tweet, I'm bringing my wife in, she's pregnant and, you know, we're going to go get the, the baby's going to be born today. And then separately, that hospital sold a bunch of de-identified health records where a woman aged 30 to 35 gave mm -hmm. birth to a baby in this hour block. And now you can figure out my wife's health records. And now you can see, oh, here's where her therapist is. And here's mm -hmm. all these things that you can now put together by re-identifying. And never once did I think that my tweet or that that hospital was gonna sell those records. And unfortunately, that's a real example in England, which has really good privacy laws, but still allows anonymized records to be sold or shared, and they can be re-identified with, with an additional data point. And I don't think people realize how bad that can be. And I don't, I don't know how to educate that trade-off. And that's what we're working on. It's like, how do we educate you on the trade-off of what you wish that Johns Hopkins knew about you, what you wish they didn't have handy that could be stolen. How do we give you the best process of service and also the minimal risk? That's a really hard problem that the experts don't know the answer to. Why would consumers? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, sort of countless problems to, to be solved there and different approaches to doing it. Obviously, one approach is to, as we already have laws on the books that say that certain institutions can only use certain types of data about people to make decisions and and mm -hmm. and do things. The other approach is sort of on, on the consumer side, education, how they use it. But I think that feels like that that's a uphill battle. Uh, we're still living in a world that, you know, people's passwords are password and 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 they use the same password on every website. I, I, I had to a month later I went to my wife's office and pulled off where it was the admin password on a post-it note. Because yeah. I provided it to someone and she just left it in the front lobby for a month. And yes. Yeah. Right. And it's not that she's not smart. It's just that she's not thinking about the risks of that and not aware of what the downsides are. Yeah. And, and I, I would suggest, is... nor should she, right? Like, yes, because if we're all required to, to be sort of using these services, constantly thinking about how data could be correlated with some other data that we've leaked and, and be used, like, I think that that is, is a tremendous amount of overhead. Uh, and that's an interesting way to look at it, sort of like with PayPal. I mean, they're dealing with millions of dollars of loss every day in fraud, but I never think about that. It's right. just I pay them. They take a certain tax when you do goods and services and they pay for all that. And I don't have to worry about it. That's yeah. Fair point. Sh yeah. you know, should we have to worry about it in other fields? Yeah. I, um, you know, you mentioned decision making using certain information, and that's a great segue for me to 
be concerned about black box, right? It's yeah. really easy to say you're not allowed to take gender or other protected class information into a decision about credit risk, education, whatever else, but then you have a black box system that trains on data and you have no idea what it's using to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, could be exactly that. As soon as you put a black box in the way, you've got an issue. Totally agree. I, I, I think the being able to generally understand what these, you know, AI assisted, let's call them systems are doing is of great value, specifically for consumers to feel comfortable that they generally understand what's happening. But but obviously these these neural networks are are all of these sort of weights and biases that happen inside of those middle layers to try to label all of them and and explain them would be a futile effort because many of the decisions are not in this example being based on race or mm -hmm. gender but being based on countless other things mm -hmm. that that might embed in them sort of race and gender but are not those things really at all they're just correlations that exist right. that that can be pointed to oh this is biased for race and gender, but that's not what the neural network is doing, right? It's really not looking at that in this scenario, I would say. So yeah, it's, uh, the, the complexity is too high for a human brain to follow it anyway. And sort right. of like, even if it were a completely straightforward decision tree and it just had a hundred billion decision points, right. it, exactly. you can't follow it down anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, I hope that we will find ourselves soon in a situation where explainable techniques, which is why I came out of retirement, was to work on explainable human understandable techniques. If you don't use one, you're setting yourself up for the most painful audits ever, right? One person comes and sues you and says, I don't think I got into Harvard because of your algorithm. Mm -hmm. And then Harvard either says, no, no, here you can trace it and it shows you exactly why you didn't get in. Or even, gosh, you're right, we traced it and it is because of your age, gender, whatever it is. That's a bug. I'm so sorry. We're fixing it now and we can go, like, that's still better. Or they spend four years in court defending their neural network, which they can't defend and end up settling for lots of money. And so you, you get this new world where anybody who's using opaque techniques to make important decisions that are protected by law is just waiting for a you know, they're, they're just begging for a lawsuit, right? It's yeah. like burning all your receipts and then calling the IRS. So who knows? Maybe maybe that'll be what happens. That, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually super curious about the stuff you guys are, are, are doing at, at Dive Plane. Would, would love to dive into it, but maybe a, a couple of questions first. So explainable also implies, I think for some people, sort of limited in its capabilities because a lot of the power of, again, sort of modern, AI, modern neural networks, is sort of the, the level of resolution, the number of parameters that are taken into account to calculate all of these mm -hmm. things. And again, most of these things you can never sort of label and explain. This is why sort of the researchers say we don't really know how they work because there's like mm -hmm. too many connections doing too many things. You can do some tracing of it potentially and say, well, look, these are biasing on these certain dimensions that can be correlated to. But again, do you have any like real world examples where like you've been able to sort of do this in, in practice or are you guys still sort of at the early stages of, oh, of sort of no. bringing this? It, so let me address first the point and then I can talk to some examples. So let's imagine you've got some data set. Let me come up with something that makes sense. I don't know, we'll do coffee purchasing habits at a start. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Starbucks. How many features define that? And how complex are those functions? Like mm -hmm. I could imagine there's like a hundred different factors that could go into that, maybe 150. And each of those could have a function that's super complicated, like 10th degree polynomial. Like that sounds crazy, but imagine it actually was that complicated. Well, what do you need a hundred billion function approximators for? But you, you don't, you need a thousand or a hundred to do it right. And explainable techniques can easily handle thousands of those. So, and, and I'm saying like, not even just ours, but lots of them can. And so it, things get a little different when you're talking about every pixel in a movie 
Like, you know, mm -hmm. that's so much going on that mm -hmm. there aren't any explainable techniques that can really address that right now. Mm -hmm. But it's more of the complexity of the problem size rather than the accuracy of the solution. So, and then, so you, so you asked about some things we're doing. Uh, with Actually, I'm sorry, to interrupt. if I could stop here and just make a point for listeners. I, I think this is like really important. And I think sort of clarifying it would help people understand it. Yeah. I, I, let me see if I can paraphrase it. Basically, what you're saying, which makes sense, is... These black box AI systems can be extraordinarily, this is the, the, the power we have today and, and, and sort of the power of compute and parallel processing of transformers and sort of like architectures of, of neural networks that have sort of been updated, where we now can have sort of crunch much more data and, and take many countless parameters into account. And that for many problems, that your example of the problem of coffee habits don't need such complexity in sort of it in, 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 and to give up this ability to to make them explainable and perhaps we simplify the inputs and and, and how these systems work and and get explainability but may lose potentially some optimization by these other sort of not, not even that necessarily no because of the problem of when you think about how a neural network is these weights and biases, it, they're all over the place, scattered randomly, right? Yeah, and they could be doing the exact same thing. There's this really famous, is this a truck analyzer using convolved neural nets and or convolutional neural networks? And all it was doing is detecting whether there was a cloud in the sky. And that was the whole thing it was doing. And all the other pixels were thrown away. It was ignoring them all, but it's doing all sorts of work madly, right? And that's or there was a medical, it was like a cancer test. Has it been benign or malign, malignant? And all it was doing was looking at the last digit in the patient record number. And it's doing all this work and there's steam coming out of the machine and they're spending a thousand dollars an hour, but everything at the end gets thrown out until that one weight is saying, if it's odd, it's yes, if it's even, it's no. So that's an efficiency of solution problem. It didn't need that level of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now it happened to be a bad solution, but you could imagine that you just don't need a billion computers working in parallel, one by computer, I mean, an artificial mm -hmm. neuron, mm -hmm. right? You don't need that complexity to solve certain kinds of problems. You just don't. So the accuracy of solutions actually worse because you're throwing in all these other answers and that may or may, may not be useful. They may not be relevant. And so mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to figure out what's going on. Uh, that no, black box means you can't iterate. But, mm -hmm. You know, you build it, and if it seems good enough and you test it, you stop. But you don't get to go back a step and say, mm, let's fix it this way. Let's fix it that way. What you do is you build a new model. You go find some more data and train it. But you can't tweak. Like in software, if it's not performing like you want, you trace down, figure out why, fix that thing, and say, wow, it's better now. Now it's passing the test. So mm -hmm. explainable techniques that are also editable, you can do that just like with software, and it will iterate and get better. Mm -hmm. Anyway, soapbox. I love this stuff. No, look, I, I think this is this is really interesting. I think you know, listeners and viewers will will, will benefit from these right. sort of nuances here. So I, I took a look at at, at the website of, of Dive Plane, and and it reminded me a little bit of sort of I know a company called Gretel AI, yeah. meaning sort of synthetic data is a really important and sort of powerful approach to being able to do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of again, what is dive plane and like what are the things that really you guys are working on like what what is explainable ai and what does synthetic data have to do with it and how do like all these sure. pieces fit together yeah all right so at its core what we've built is an engine for explainable machine learning it's based on k nearest neighbors which is a really old popular technique it's just as older older than neural networks are you know from the 70s it's always been explainable, but it's generally a footnote in AI classes because you can't scale it to real world problems, can't get big enough, and because it has trouble with scale invariance. That is, is orange closer to blue than cat is to dog? Well, I mean, how do you build those axes? You know, okay, I get it if they're all numbers, but it gets real confusing with their dates and then it goes crazy and it's numbers, right? So we figured out a way to solve both those issues. So we can run k nearest neighbors on what normally blows up exponentially in the number of features in a problem set. We can handle thousands as opposed to 10. And we handle the scale invariance problem with probability. So it's like, how likely is it 
that a car driving by is going to be a red truck versus a blue Ford Focus. Well, those are stored in the system and, and we use nearness based on probability. So that's the, the cool math. It's all entropy, surprisal, it's neat stuff. But what that gave us is a ML where the data is always in the model. So you load the data in and now you just start asking questions. There's no transformation where you are like in a neural network training all these little nodes to do something. And then the data is done. And now you have this model you've built, this thing that got built. The data is always there in our system. Mm -hmm. And so you can just ask questions like, you know, who are the five patients who have behavior most similar to Dimitri's mm -hmm. or records most similar? And did they all need the surgery? And if every one of them did, well, I bet you Dimitri probably needs the surgery. What if we go out to the 50 nearest patients? Well, they mm -hmm. all need the surgery and they all look good too. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so now a doctor can look at that result and it doesn't just say the AI says give him the surgery. It says, you know, here's Liz. Liz needed the surgery and it worked. Mm -hmm. Remember Liz? Look, take a look. And so it's real records of people. And you go, mm -hmm. I get it now. Well, what would have to change for, for me to say Dimitri doesn't get the surgery? And you can say, oh, well, you'd have to go this far out to Mike and see Mike's record and see the difference here. This is, you know, I don't know, Mike's too fat. He doesn't get surgery because he's too chubby. So, okay, so now we can see it, but it's put in terms that went into the training, not weights and measures and a yes or no answer. Who knows if it's right or not? It's explaining to you in the data that trained it. And that also means when Liz comes up and you're like, whoa, 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 this is a surgery only for men. What is she doing in there? You can delete it out and go, all right, now what would you say? And now you can fix it by just changing the data that's in the model because the model is alive and well. All right, so you've got this explainable system where, you know, should we build a Starbucks at this intersection? Well, this intersection is most like these 10 intersections around the world and all of them failed when we put a Starbucks there, so let's don't do it. It can do that for you. That's okay. awesome. So that explainable ML can do a lot of cool things. We started in military where... The red team is the bad guys, and they would be red team AI against real human blue team good guys. And when the red team would win, the blue guys had no idea why. And you do that about 10 times in a row. It's about as fun as you or me playing AlphaGo or a chess engine. It just beats the snot out of you and can't tell you why you suck. And so that was the big step for us was being able to explain the reason I knew to blow up that supply line two days ago was because I'd seen this before. This is why I did it from these four exercises I'd seen in the past that you trained me on. Now let's try again. So the humans could get better by learning from an explainable AI. Make sense? It, it, it does. Let me see if I could clarify again some things. So what, what I'm hearing you say sounds sort of more like a, like a vector database where you are you know, looking for nearest neighbor calculations. And to your mm -hmm. point, you're not training it, you're Correct. loading it, and then you can query it. And it can yes. have many embeddings and, and many parameters, especially modern vector databases, you know, yes. support that. And, and so I guess my question, what, what's the ML part of it? Like, what is it learning? You mean well, sort of just instantiating the, the, the vector database? So that's a good question. It's like at its heart, is this really ML anymore? Just because you can use it to classify, predict right. every regression, everything you can do with an ML, is it ML? No, it is a spatial database, right? All we did was take those vectors, organize them in space, and that space happens to be probability space. And that's what gets you that, you know, is this most like a duck or not? Yes, it's most like a duck based on all the data points that are in here. It's most mm -hmm. like a duck. And how does it do that? It's doing a distance compare with this new point, drops it in the database and does distance. And distance is in LP space. And what that gives you is really good all the things in ML's do. So mm -hmm. it is the most accurate machine learning platform we know of for small data sets, better than light GBM, you name it. You can't wait. We're going to put it out and open source big chunks of it and share it. it. It can do some really neat things with really small data points because it doesn't have to Artificial neural networks are like kids where you have to tell them again and again for them to learn, right? You have to keep showing them thousands and thousands of points and it's learning something every time, but not mm -hmm. all of it. Ours learns everything, keeps it all. So it's all stored there. So you don't have to keep telling them again and again, what is a Starbucks, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that makes sense. 
Okay, uh, so actually, that, oh, you're not going to go ahead. No, please go ahead. Sure. So that, so that core does lots of cool stuff. And we've done, you know, predicting patient outcomes for providers. We've done cool stuff for the military. Let's see, what have we done that we can talk about? MasterCard's one of our public customers. They use us for all sorts of interesting problems related to detecting fraud, predicting fraud, and the like. We realized early on that we could handle sparse data, that is, data points that were missing the age, but everything else is there. And neural nets usually barf on sparse data because they don't know how to train on it. And we just put a in minus two dimensional data point into an n dimensional data set, and that's fine. It just works. And the behind the scenes, what we do is just impute a data point that, it, uh, sorry, a, a value for those missing data points that is reasonable. And it turns out that's all synthetic data is. And, and so we, we build a model of say a thousand patients. And then you say, I would like 500 patients that the database has the exact same statistics as the original one, but I want all those points to not be real people. Mm -hmm. And so we just generate a reasonable, non-surprising, a mathematical sense of non-surprising person. And the first one's 40 years old, female, and five foot eight. Well, the next one better be male to keep the statistics right. And then mm -hmm. the next one better be, and you get it, we just keep filling in, keeping the statistics right all the time until we have a new database of 500 people, none of whom exist in any way. We double check that none of them are even close with probability space. So nothing's even vaguely close to the original. So there's no privacy leakage. And now mm -hmm. we have a synthetic data set whose statistical shape is precisely the same as the original that is perfect for applications like the ones you're talking about with synthetic data. So most techniques like use GANs and some other things, and they aren't able to achieve a level of accuracy and privacy that we're able to. So yeah, so we, now we're in the synthetic data business, but it's just one piece of the puzzle here. I see that. That that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, maybe we jump into some some sort of other areas that that might be interesting to to listen. Yeah, let's. So AI has been around for a very long time. We've all been benefiting from it in countless ways. You know, we were talking mm -hmm. about recommendations engines, right? Which are all machine learning driven. Yeah. Netflix um, keeps me busy. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, back in 2000, late 2005, early 2006, I was working with a guy named Dr. Ted Dunning, who's my chief scientist at a company called Vio that I started, which was a competitor to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we were doing collaborative filtering in order to, you know, people that watch this may also like to watch yeah. that. Perfect. Right? Yeah, These so were it's early. A nearest neighbor, right? You're nearest really neighbor, exactly. Like you, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Him. Yeah. And so we, to support your earlier story, we at one time had 40 some odd, I think 43 is the number in my head, servers that were computing a pipeline to, you know, spit out recommendations, personalized recommendations for various users. Mm -hmm. and, and we had tens of millions of users at the time. And, and these servers were basically dying. And, 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 you know, the pipeline calculation took longer and longer, and we were sort of crunching us out. And we hired an intern from UCSD that showed up and brought with him an O'Reilly book. And out of that O'Reilly book, he copied 30 some odd lines of Python code and put it on one machine. And those 30 some odd lines that he literally copied out of that O'Reilly book I'm struggling to remember its name. Maybe I will by time of by the end of this podcast. Basically, did the same thing within sort of two percentage points of this other set of you know, cluster of machines. Mm -hmm. It was just radically simpler. To your point, it just sort of recognizes the important parts. So, real world example from like way way back on this. Mm -hmm. But now, the reason I think everybody is excited, meaning everybody, consumers are excited. Enterprises have been using AI for a very long time. There's countless uses, really important, countless applications. Sort of consumer accessible AI, where consumers can do something with it, is relatively new, you know, really sort of brought it into the forefront you know, by the launch of ChatGPT, right? And these diffusion models for, for image generation and video coming soon. Yes. And today people are sort of excited that they can type some words into a prompt, you know, basically a command line interface, a text box, DOS, Mm -hmm. 
and and this thing can output something and it sounds like a human and you can sort of talk to it and some people fall in love with it and we say oh wow marvelous and we celebrate its power and while many other people that are in the in the business are like actually it's just predicting the next the probability of the next word the next yes. word, right and now it's amazing what it can do just by predicting the probability of that like can do I never would have that. guessed it would be this good right but that's all it is right yeah but but that's all it is but Beyond that, do you have a, again, sort of like a visionary view of like, what are the interesting things that that people aren't yet excited about, but maybe should be excited about that, that are coming because of of these technologies, whether it's whether it's in consumer or enterprise, I guess, like, what, what's interesting, do you think that sort of next that that folks might want to pay attention to? Sure. I mean, it's all crazy interesting and moving too fast. I, I don't know anyone who AI, in AI who can keep up, right? That's the strange thing. You should be like, oh, didn't you see that two weeks ago? Someone did that. So the open source community is amazing in this space right now because it's so easy to put together a complex prompt. You know, like you can train a prompt to be a sci-fi novelist and hand it to somebody and it's generating really good sci-fi novels for you or mm -hmm. One of my favorite prompts is one that teaches AI to you. So mm -hmm. it figures out what level of AI you already know and then starts teaching you AI. So it's an AI teaching you yeah. about how to make an AI. It's, it's fascinating. And I don't think anyone was expecting that level of prompt engineering. But the go forward is really opaque to me. You know, I think when we saw like the, say the 3GS iPhone, you could kind of see a path to this is a legitimate gaming platform and we're going to see this really disrupt like you know, digital mm -hmm. disruption is happening mobile is everywhere and now like you can put those pieces together as a smart mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. and say like i bet two years four years whatever it is the app store is going to be a big part of the game i don't see what's going to happen i can't figure it out i, I mean i i've got a bet that netflix will be generating movies for me with a stable of stars that they have licensed within three mm -hmm. where I just say like I want a movie and it's going to star me and my wife and Ryan Reynolds and he's a wise cracking assassin and we just start watching and then you know and will it be as good as the very best Deadpool movie do I care because I'll just say mm, I need a little bit more action Right. And it just starts pushing the right way. Like, can we do this in the jungle? And we start going the right way. There's no reason we can't be doing that sort of intentional authoring. And I I was working with the, the Unity guys on that in 3D. And that was our like someday, seven years from now, we'll have intentional placement of 3D objects. But I never would have thought we'd have an intentional expression of I want a couch. No, no, a bigger couch as opposed to like looking in a library and sorting, because I thought it would be that. I never would have imagined that you'd be creating content. And I bet we're all living in our own bubbles of created content so soon, which is good because none of us will have jobs. So, because it's going to be really hard to find jobs that we're better at than GPT-6. So mm -hmm. the, the impact on the job market, I can't predict. I've got a 10 year old and I don't, you know, before it was go get a computer science degree, learn to program. Well, now it turns out programming is way easier for chat GPT. Well, not chat, but, you know, for Copilot to do way easier for it to because it's a structured language. It's much simpler for it to do that than to write movies. So you should <laughs> go write movies, right? But no, you shouldn't write movies because one guy can generate 50 scripts a week. So yeah. yeah, or no guy required to generate 50 scripts. Exactly. It's like one prompt engineer who did it once and then they fired the prompt engineer too. Right. right? And just right. scripts get generated for Netflix at a pace appropriate to what they need. Yeah. So I think I think there are a few things here that, that you mentioned that are, are really important, I think, for people to 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 grok, I believe important. One is that innovation used to feel somewhat linear. And we could generally see the sort of straight line of how we get from introduction of iPhone to iPhone now is, you know, all of these mm -hmm. apps and facilitates gaming and all of that. That was yeah, you're pretty really reading TechCrunch and you're on it and you know what's coming. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see the next two to five years. Yeah. Right. And, and it took time for all of these things to be built because humans had to build them and, mm -hmm. and that. And certainly one of the things that the AI world has sprung upon us is the need to try to be able to deal with sort of exponential 
innovation that's happening in parallel across sort of many, many dimensions. And, and therefore, it's sort of hard to predict, to your point, like if, unless you're paying attention every day, there's meaningful innovations every week. There are massive innovations. And at any moment, any industry could be disrupted faster than anything has been able to disrupt anything. Therefore, it's hard to plan careers, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for people around that. So I, 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 I fully ag agree with that. Agility uh, becomes the primary skill. Right, right. which is which it's always been, I think, arguably for for people. And it is a, uh, uh, yeah, it's just you didn't you didn't you, you needed to be able to change direction on your boat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. that you need to be able to do backflips. Right, the yeah. the there's a new language this week. Learn that programming language. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, I I think the other thing that that you mentioned that I think is really important is this ability for generative AI to create custom on-demand content mm -hmm. for each of us, where before we would say, here's an audience that we're making content for. We understand who they are, how they think personas, as they're known yep. in marketing, mm -hmm. and, and let's create entertainment for them, whether mm -hmm. it's games or, or motion pictures or whatever. And and you had to pick sort of the, because everything's a business, you had to pick an audience that was broad enough so that you could sort of generate income and, and create something that appealed to a broad enough audience in some ways, sort of create lowest common denominator, things that are uh, appeal to that. And now with sort of the, the cost of creating content going to practically zero soon, and the speed of creating content, including video coming soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also very much see that content creation as a whole gets transformed and that the need for humans to create content for one another becomes extraordinarily questionable in its value. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and But then you start to get into, I think, things that become, at least that I find super interesting, which is, you know, you were mentioning, here's a sofa, make it bigger. This is like, you know what you want and you can tell the AI what you want. But arguably the magic of, I think, of this new phase of computing is that humans don't know what we want. Meaning we don't know what we don't know. And so mm -hmm. we can't even ask for it. And serendipity and surprise are the things that make life worth living, arguably. Right, like those are the things that turn yeah, us on. Sure, delight. And and that AI has the power, although we haven't seen it really implemented yet. But AI has the power to be able to understand each of us individually, if we are willing to engage with it, mm -hmm. and then help us discover the things we don't know, and fill them in, create on-demand content to fill in all the holes <laughs> in our minds. Mm -hmm. Like the Neo, you know, plug in the back of the head, I know Kung Fu. I think we are, that, that's at our feet right now to be able to do. I, I like that. You know, I was thinking about this sort of slow shift, you know, because my first days in video games were, you know, Gears of War, $50 million marketing budget that's all going to blow out in commercials over like a four week period. Right, you're burning discs, backing up trucks, shipping discs all over the world. You're guessing there are enough guys who like Spike TV and therefore will like a game that's got a chainsaw. And mm -hmm. then, you know, right, so it's all this predictive work. And that shifted over a period of years to, I don't know, let's just ship it and see what happens. And then if people start playing it, we'll double down. And you know, there was this mm -hmm. studio I remember that had, they would ship a game every two weeks and, you know, put maybe four person months of effort in and the ones that clicked, they'd keep doubling on. And then eventually they would just clone their own successes following the market. So entirely product led. And so of course there were skills that no longer mattered. I mean, you no longer needed somebody who knew how to book a commercial, much less shoot one, right? Because that all went away. And then you had this long tail notion where like once it's on the store, you can keep selling forever. And the same like Amazon has given us that in books where mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's a small niche as long as it's an evergreen niche. Really becomes interesting when you take that 
and you just keep hyper focusing it down to one person. And I hope I'll have the ability to say, you know, entertain me tonight, but don't forget, I have a long term goal of weight loss and mm -hmm. learning a bit more about kite surfing, mm -hmm. right? You know, like mm -hmm. fit some of that in as well. You know, give me a little bit of vegetables with my french fries or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I guess french fries or vegetables, but you get my point. So that I'm growing as a person a little bit because otherwise I'm going to be watching nonstop Adam Sandler crap from Netflix, right? Because that's yeah. what the market's demanding is bad Adam Sandler movies. Yeah. Well, I think that, again, I think this is the, I think this is our opportunity on the positive side of, of all of this transformation is, <clears throat> is to be able to leverage these new technologies to help us get past our own sort of bad habits and addictions mm -hmm. uh, and, and say, here's what I'd like to optimize for, or even more importantly, for the AI to say, here are a bunch of things Pick ones you would like more of in your life, and here are a bunch of things you'd like less of in your life. Mm -hmm. And I will then sort of keep an eye on that and propose to you a diet of things that are what you want to optimize for mm -hmm. and less of the things that you don't. I love and the idea so, of an accountability coach slash provider, right? You know, so it's yeah. not just an accountability coach, because if you're there every minute and you're in charge of the websites I see, and I've asked you for, you could subtly weave it in. Like, it's okay if I read it for a little while, R-E-D-D-I-T, mean Reddit, but, you know, put something in, in that, that it's the Reddit for kite surfing, right? And just mix it in. And eventually I will, because I'm, humans are so easily programmed, right? Yes. The habit systems are built in. That's what we do because we're surprisal based, right? So yeah, no, that's, that's a way less dystopian future that at least while we're all out of our writing jobs and our programming jobs and the like, when we're at home, at least we're getting better at our chosen hobbies. But, <laughs> but you are open to being subtly pushed. Like you see that as, as positive, subtly Absolutely. controlled. I mean, you know, having spent years trying to lose weight and finally did some, and it's all habit based, like something that could just mix my diet a little bit for me, but not, you know, say you're never having dessert again. That's way better than me having to put all the cognitive effort into doing that. And I'd, I could apply that to a lot of things, you know, help me manage yeah. procrastination. <laughs> You know, if the Pomodoro technique works for Dimitri, but it doesn't work for me, then I'm getting different intervals and it's learning what works based on my productivity. Like, why not? That's super cool. A little like working at Amazon. Yeah. Exactly. The non-dystopian version, yeah. the utopian version of working at Amazon, where it yeah, tracks exactly. everything you do and helps you be a better you. You're in control, and and but it but it's smarter than you, meaning it's right. more it has more resolution it pays attention to more variables and 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 can can find the things that you don't know you don't know most of us are extraordinarily unaware of our weaknesses mm -hmm. and go about life sort of with that handicap but if something could discover those weaknesses it could one either give us a digital prosthetic meaning simply augment it and say, don't worry about it. You can still be clumsy and I will make sure that you're not falling mm -hmm. uh, or simply let us see that clearly that this is a deficiency we have. And then we ourselves can sort of learn this or, or work on it, et cetera. I, I think these are the, the, the things that I think most people haven't really realized yet, that the real power of chat GPT is not that you can treat it like a better Google Mm -hmm. and a conversational Google, which is, I think, how most people are treating it now, or like give it tasks of write, write me an article so that you can cheat on a test or or send emails without actually having to type. Like, I think all of these are are, are trivial novelty use cases. Mm -hmm. The big use cases for consumers are ultimate personalized content creation, personalized learning, understanding of oneself, discovery of, again, of, of things that one you don't know about yourself and yeah, I like that notion of instrumenting ourselves more fully. You know, if you give me a 80 factors to decide which car to buy, I'm really only going to put five or six in my head because I can't look right. at 10 different numbers. I can't do all those functions in my head. And so ask me to do about myself. I'm still not going to be able to do that. So yeah. if you provide that much information to an AI who also has all that experience of how everybody else learned, then yes, absolutely. We are so hackable in a great way. 
It's mm -hmm. just, boy, you have to trust that AI that it's hacking you the right way and doing the right thing. And that data is sure. never leaving the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. These um, are all topics I find fascinating. And I love that my lack of expertise did not in any way stop you from asking me stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, the, if we just let the experts do the work, they, you know, they end up getting us into mostly dead ends, I, I think. And, and so I, I always like to ask the, the like, I, I'm building this AI company to UAI. Mm -hmm. I, I have worked with AI. I worked, I ran product on three machine learning teams at Google from 2012 to 2016. But certainly I, I'm an amateur, as is everybody else on our team. And I think that's what makes us the right team to build it mm -hmm. because we can ask stupid questions and try things that pros wouldn't try. Right. Like those 30 some odd lines of code out of that book yes. versus that 43 you know, machine yeah. cluster. Yeah, let's optimize what we have as opposed to taking that moment to step yeah. back. Well, yeah, one, um, was, one was built by a PhD. One was built by an intern that copied some things out of a book. Mm -hmm. This one won. <laughs> yes. and that's not uncommon. Well, I look forward to our tech being the one your next intern uses. We're, we're in a secret freeware right now so that people can start playing with it, testing it and the like, and then we will be putting it out as open source, I hope in the next few months. And I hope that's going to come with some pretty big announcements about how we beat certain GPT type tech at their own game, even though that's not what we're designed for on some benchmarks and it's going to be fun. We're going to kind of do a big coming out party with everything. So thanks so much for, for spending the time with us yeah. uh, today. Really enjoyed our conversation. And yeah, I enjoyed it too. Take care.